Hi, I'm Colin Hung with Healthcare IT Today, where we explore the latest trends and interesting stories in health IT. On today's program, we're going to be talking about practical interoperability. Our guests today are Eric Jacob, Director of Interoperability at Rochester Regional Health, and Charlie Harp, CEO at Clinical Architecture, a frequent guest on our program. I can't wait to ask both of them why they believe that interoperability must be more than an academic exercise and why it needs to be more practical. Eric, Charlie, welcome to the program. Thank you, Colin. Thanks, Colin. All right. So, Eric, before we dive into the deep discussion around interoperability, can you give our audience a bit of a brief overview of Rochester Regional Health? Certainly. Uh, well, Rochester Regional, formed by uh, merging uh, crosstown health systems uh, back in uh, the mid 2010s, and since then uh, moved from you know the combined three hospitals to um, an eight hospital system right now, and it spreads across uh, Western uh, uh, New York as well as Northern New York with uh, a group of three hospitals. So. At this point, we're uh, the, I guess, the largest geographic spread um, in New York State for a health system uh, and provide uh, acute care, um, certainly ambulatory services, uh, elder care, and home health. So it sounds like you do it all. <laughs> a little bit of everything, yes. Excellent. And you're not actually not too far away from where I am and here in Toronto. We're just across the lake from each other, which is which is great. So on a clear day, maybe we can see each other. That's right. We'll wave to each other from across each other from across the lake. <laughs> so Eric, I understand that the one of the very first things that your team did at Rochester Regional Health uh, was to make lab data interoperable with your Epic system. Why, why did you start with lab data? Well, uh, starting with labs seemed to make sense. Uh, we had uh, some expertise from and enterprise health information exchange that we had to do a lot of mapping with. But when we moved to Epic, uh, we retired that system and wanted to have the same level of granularity and accuracy for our providers. So we needed to come up with a way to bring in external data from many of the health information exchanges of New York State to augment our chart. Uh, so lab data has uh, uh, some good standards to rely on, uh, very good you know, data points, but it's all about looking at that content and seeing how we can get it to the individual providers to make their decisions. And Eric, did you have to do anything special to make that lab data interoperable, especially from those different sources, it sounds like, from the, um, from the health information exchanges up there? Well, we started in the world of uh, version two HL7. So everything's a little bit different and we really needed to come up with a way to really understand what data was in there. What could we work with? How do we establish quality? How do we set rules around what we're going to do and give, you know, give our team procedures on what we're going to look at and then come up with a way to you know, bring that in at the high volume that is out there. So uh, we did uh, call on uh, uh, some old expertise with Charlie and uh, clinical architecture to help design. You call me old, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> I'm not that old. We've been at this for a little while together. Uh, we are salty dogs, that's true. So, so let me let me go over there, Charlie. So, what what did your team have to do to make that data interoperable? Was it was it a challenge to get the data from those health information exchanges and and all that lab data into a usable format? I mean, Eric and his team were already pulling all the data in through their interfaces um, into Epic. The thing about lab data is um, when you think about all the different telemetry we get about a patient. You know, medications are important because it lets us know what's going on with the patient from a from a, a treatment perspective and can kind of give us insight into what their likely diagnosis is if you don't have that. But lab data is like the closest thing you have to 
you know, status on a human being and how they're doing. So vital signs, lab data, those are all kind of what I would consider to be critical telemetry. And the challenge you have when you're getting data from external sources is if you can't reconcile it um, appropriately, it can't get in front of the provider who needs that vital telemetry so they can kind of get a feel for where the patient's at. The challenge with labs, um, and I've been working with lab systems to kind of confirm the uh, attestation that I am old by my dear friend, Eric, um, since 1987. And the, the, when you look at lab data, um, we use LOINC today to normalize that data. Um, but the, the issue you have sometimes is that not everybody um, really understands the granularity of LOINC and not everybody today provides LOINC, but we have enough things in the lab stream, especially if you're pulling something from an HL7 message fire or CCDA to typically identify what the appropriate code is um, if you're trying to normalize. And there were some additional things we did specifically to help with the integration of, with Epic um, and to get things organized in a way that Epic could, uh, could process it appropriately. Um, but lab is one of those things where um, if you've been doing it for a while, you kind of know which things are most important to be able to line everything up and find the right place for, for you to land that data. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, and that's perfect. No, thanks for that color, uh, Charlie. I really yeah. appreciate that. Um, Eric, one of, the, one of the things you mentioned to me off air was how making the investment in uh, the lab data and making it interoperable is paying off um, especially when it comes to acquisitions, which is a, a little bit odd to me. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought about acquisitions as a as a use case for for lab data. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Certainly. Um, so a lot of the process around you know an expanding health system would be related to taking an accounting of the existing systems, the content, and you know kind of working towards consolidating those. IT systems to a standard stack. So at that point, you know, now you're on the you know, standard lab system, a standard EMR, you'll want to do a conversion of the historical content. And a lot of times that is a arduous task of taking each individual thing, identifying what, what it is, where it fits. And sometimes that that effort is just too much to, uh, you know, take on, uh, you know, in a kind of a cost benefit, but uh, getting information into the chart in the exact place that it should be, where if the physician or you know, anyone else reviewing that chart is looking for that information as if it was recorded directly from the lab system that you're currently using, you want that information in the same place. So it, it's visible. It's actionable, it's you know, reviewable, it fits into metrics and analytics, all of those things you know, really help. So using the tool that we you know, kind of designed for live results, we found we could also use that standard conversion to speed the process of mapping the historical data into a conversion effort. And I think we were looking at, uh, you know, a team of multiple pathologists, IT experts, and, you know, subject folks to really review that data and um, the, the exact measurement. Um, but we did a comparison of, you know, maybe 12 folks sitting around a table um, mapping all of that. And, you know, you're spending thousands and thousands of hours looking at that information over several months. We're able to run that same content directly through an interface into um, the, the, the design that we have uh, you know, created with Charlie. It gains us automation. It gains us scalability to tackle all, all of those things and really direct the review of those experts. Instead of a team of 12, we can now run through that information and put it in front of the head pathologist um, so he can make the final sign-off decisions. So you, you've really streamlined your data acquisition, you have the work to actually map, and the verification of that content. So 
it, it really drives a process that's repeatable and it saves a lot of time when uh, looking at converting information from one system to another. Anything to add there, Charlie? Yeah, it's not a, I mean, it's an issue that I see health systems dealing with kind of across the, the gamut in the early days of clinical architecture. We spent a lot of time helping people with conversions and, you know, our goal was, you know, with one, with one client, we took a, what was a year long project and turn it into like a two day project. So the, uh, the mission of clinical architecture has always been maximizing the effectiveness of healthcare. Uh, and, you know, our goal is to get the data to the point where it's usable, to get to the data and improve the quality um, without some kind of intelligent healthcare oriented automation. Um, what you're really looking at is, uh, I always say it's a sweatshop of, of clinical people, you know, slaving away for a long time, doing something that is repetitive and, and not necessarily um, wonderful. There are a few sick tickets like me that like that kind of thing, but most normal people do not. Um, and to Eric's point too, <laughs> um, it's not just true of lab data, that's true for medications, it's true for di diagnoses, because uh, a lot of these systems that send data still have their own local code systems, it's how those systems are built, and they're uh, implementing a standard in a edge system is a non-trivial exercise. So it's one of those things where you'd like to say there should be an easy solution and we could just tweak this or install SNOMED or do whatever. But in reality, you know, healthcare evolves from the edges and those edges need to have the flexibility to do things the way they need to do things to help take care of patients. And so it's one of those things where um, it's, I don't think it's a problem that's going to go, go away anytime soon. Now, both of you shared a very interesting conversation uh, you had with each other. Uh, and, and as I understand it, Charlie, I think you asked Eric something like, if you could turn on the fire hose of interoperable data from all the different possible data sources, would you do it? <laughs> Eric, what, how did you respond to that question? Well, I think uh, while I'm after that goal, uh, I want to do it in the right way. So my immediate answer was absolutely not. Don't turn it all on. But we need to look at the data and we, we need to make it purposeful in the consumption of that information. Just bringing a document in is, it, it's, you know, it's a great step forward because now you have it. But the reality is exchanging, you know, full CCDA documents, they're not looking at them. So if you don't have an automation to Pull pieces of information that fit your clinical needs or your analytical needs or population health needs. So you're pulling something very specific and that something very specific isn't always in the format that you need to really understand that. And that's where taking that and that, that last mile from standard codes now back to local codes so that it's well understood inside the consuming system, that's the power of interoperability. By taking that, now you're able to, you've obtained it, now you need to leverage it and you know, make improvements for your patients, for your you know, providers, streamline the process, streamline the care, make it better. Charlie, were you surprised at Eric's answer? N no, I mean, it's one of those things where um, when you look at what we're doing in healthcare today, if you look at the last 10 years of interoperability, a lot of it was pushing messages around. So they're available to a provider um, to read as if they had time to read, you know, hundreds of pages of, of historical medical documents as text. The problem we have, and it, as we move forward with initiatives like TEFTA with the QHINs and kind of, uh, let's say, normalizing interoperability. When you look at what ONC is doing with the USCDI and establishing certain standards, those are all excellent moves. Those are all foundational, important things to do. The, the next thing we need to do, and, I, and I've talked to a number of QHINs and I think you know, they are thinking along these lines, is if you're gonna turn on a tsunami of information for the patients under your care, the real question is, are you ready to receive that tsunami in a meaningful way 
And do you trust that data to, you know, it was one thing to say, hey, here's something you might want to look at versus here's something that I've got from this other place and I'm going to make it part of your permanent record. So when the provider sees the patient in his system or her system, they are seeing data that they can rely on. So I think when it comes to doing this, you know, the Eric's response to me falls in the category of, you know, is the juice worth the squeeze, as my grandmother would say. And so um, the question is, it's great for us to receive data, but even looking at the lab data that Rochester is getting from their, their exchange partners, their labs, um, there's a certain amount of lift that goes into making that data something that they can actually take advantage of. And that's work. And we just have to figure out um, over time, how can we as an industry make sure that what we're sending out is, is the highest quality and is consumable? Because right now the onus of making use of data is always on the receiver. That's what I tell all my clients. The people sending data out, they don't have to worry about that data. It's going out. It's no longer their problem. Um, they're, they're satisfying the requirement to be able to send data out. It's the person receiving that data that has the burden of making sure the data is usable. And, and that is, that is, can be challenging. So no, it didn't surprise me. It reminds me of a saying I heard a long time ago around, uh, you know, data, you know, data without purpose is just noise. Right. And, and why would you invest in creating more noise for yourself? Right. You, you, to your point, Charlie, and to your point, Eric, it's on, upon it's incumbent upon the receiver of that data to make use of it. And if you can't use it, then the question has to be why you want it in the first place. Right. Just because it's there doesn't mean you should you know, just make it available. Um, I think I like what both of you are saying with Tefka. The trick is going to be managing expectations because we have a history in this industry of getting excited about a technology or an advancement. And if it doesn't pay immediate dividends, we're like, well, that didn't work. But the truth is when it comes to USCDI, when it comes to TEFCA, these are foundational things that we still have to figure out. It's kind of like chat GPT, you know, chat GPT is an interesting technology, large language models, you know, high speed automated fabrication is really what they are. Um, we have to figure out if we can put them to good use and how we do that. And it's no different from these other things we're, we're kind of rolling out into healthcare. They're foundational. We just have to figure out what to stand on top of them. Absolutely. The, the, I think the biggest thing, I think, Charlie, you mentioned was how do we trust? How do we build that trust in the information? It's not just establishing, you know, the pipes or the networks or the QNs or the you know, HIE or packaging something and attaching it to direct and, you know, getting it to, out to that provider. What was put into identifying that information accurately at the source? And you're spot on with, it's on the receiver. How much are we going to trust that information to make care decisions? And, you know, if this works in the way that it should, you're not gonna to have to repeat test. You're not gonna to have to re-perform that. So you have to have this implicit level of trust that just isn't there at this time. And one of the key aspects that the team you know, works on a daily basis is, do we trust this enough? What are the, you know, what are the criteria? How do we call this high quality and put it into a place that's usable and actionable versus let's not put that in. That's, that, that's something that you know, we can't rely on. And clinicians making decisions on something that you say you can't, you know, there's a portion that you can't rely on. Don't put it in the same place. Don't make it identical to the, the information that, that you act on. But that's really the, the big push of anyone in interoperability. It's not just getting the information to someone. It's how do you know that it's the same as if it, uh, you know, I pick up the phone and call my lab right here on site. I trust them. How do I do the same for outside information? That's, that's really the business that anyone working in interoperability has to be in. And that has to be their focus. How do we build trust? 
Eric, Charlie, you guys have both shared a lot of great information today, but let me ask you this uh, question. What advice do you have for anyone listening or watching this in terms of achieving interoperability or, or as we're talking about practical interoperability? Uh, Charlie, we'll, let's start with you. I mean, I think when you look at, at Rochester and the decisions they've made around the lab stuff, it's you have to put the work in um, because even though an individual provider taking care of a patient is, is doing a good job and they're doing their best um, and they might be operating against their notes and they know what they know and they're talking to the patient, they're having a real um, experience with the patient. We've gotten to the point in healthcare where these systems that we use augment that care. They're how we track activity and performance at a population level. So we can't just get back to saying, well, I'm treating the patient okay. Um, you have to put the work in so that these systems can help. There's just too much, um, there are too few providers, there are too many patients, there's too much happening in healthcare for us not to be able to leverage that. And if you look at what happened at Rochester, it was something as straightforward as, I don't wanna have to search for this external result. I want it to appear somewhere that makes logical sense to me, the provider, when I see the patient, that is practical interoperability. There's data out there that's gonna materially affect how I can take care of my patient and it's gotta be somewhere where I can find it. But if you take that concept and you blow it out when it comes to decision support, quality measures, value-based care, population health, AI, ML, all of those things require you to put in the work necessary to improve the quality of your data. You just have to do it. It's not an option. Eric, what advice do you have? Well, I, I couldn't agree with Charlie more. It's, it, it really is looking at the information, finding ways to be able to identify your trust, identify your quality, and fo focus on the things that your stakeholders are interested in in improving so to, to learn that you got to talk to them you know it's not just putting in a technical solution to have a cool technical solution we, we have to talk with our physicians gather their you know their thoughts their feedback and once the information comes in those are the things that we can tailor and custom um, build to to meet their needs? Are there certain data sets that you want to prioritize? Are there service lines that need, you know, more, more care? Even, you know, it doesn't matter if it's lab data or any, any particular results-based uh, information, notes, uh, wh whatever it is, pick, you know, your, you know, your use cases, because you're really building this to solve problems, not just to send data and you know, all across the nation. It's how do we solve the problems of not knowing, you know, filling the gap. Uh, we, uh, we have a kind of a, you know, a, a team goal and in, in this mission, you know, we're, we're looking at filling the gaps between the electronic record, birth to death, what are the gaps? Interoperability fills those gaps and allows them, you know, the providers to be comfortable in their decisions, knowing that those gaps are well understood. Colin, I would like to say one more thing. Sure. Um, the folks at Rochester, Eric and his team and, and the people that, that support them, um, they're, they're a great example of people in healthcare who have a real passion for what we do. And as a vendor, as a, as a vendor in healthcare, um, we're very grateful to have had the opportunity to work with people that are committed, innovative, and, and kind of really looking for ways to solve these problems. Um, and it's been a real pleasure working with the folks at Rochester. They're, they're, I've, I've been, I feel very grateful to have had that opportunity. And I'm not just saying that because they called me old. Um, I'm saying that because I truly mean it. So thank you. Eric, where can people go if they want to find more information about Rochester Regional Health? How about uh, rochesterregional.org. Um, health system website has, uh, you know, all, all the services, uh, 
and, and information you can find your doctors, find your locations for all those across the you know, Rochester region and Northern New York. Awesome. And same question to you, Charlie, where can people go to find more information about clinical architecture? I mean, you can go to clinicalarchitecture.com. You can also check in on the InfraMonster podcast. Hey, listen, uh, thank you to both of you for being on our program today. You've shared so much fantastic information. I think our audience is really going to enjoy this. Let's hope. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Colin. Great seeing you guys today. And hey, if you like this interview as much as I did, we'd love for you to go check out our other content at healthcareittoday.com. I'm Colin Hung, and we'll catch you on the next video.